hold you that excitement next time I call a prayer meeting. <laughs> All right. I was going to sing and dance that, but I thought it'd be better to let him. Anybody who saw me over on the right-hand side knows why. I love the quote that he uses there by Tim Rutledge. He says this, if God answered the prayers you've been praying, would it change anyone else's world but your own? Would it change anybody else's world but your own? Today's message is called Personal and Powerful. And today is an introduction to this year's series, Pray. The title back up there. Pray 2019. That is going to be our theme for the entire year. Last year was We Are the Church. This year is Pray 19. If you're going to hashtag that, do it. Pray 19. Hashtag Pray 19. Everything we uh, do this year is going to be covered in that theme because I want to, for us, this is what my thought was a while back, and this is what God's been doing in my heart for the last few months. Uh, talk to some of the people I've been talking to. Uh, this has been something that I've been working on in my mind and praying about for probably four months now, trying to get uh, God's uh, direction for this 2019. And this is what I got. We've done all that we can do. We set this sucker up every week. We bought all the equipment. We have lots of really good programs. I'm just saying, we do. We have, we have good children's. We got, we got a brand new children's pastor, though she's out taking care of her own baby now. But uh, we, we, got, we, got, we got programs. We got stuff. We got events. There's youth, young adults events. There's women's events. There's, you know, summer, uh, you know, we did mini golf tournaments and chili eat-offs and all that stuff. And that's all great. Please do not misunderstand. That's important. But we've done that. We have all the infrastructure in place. What's been on my heart now is that we have to win the battles in the spiritual before anything is going to explode for the kingdom in our church. So that's what I want to say. And this is what this series to this month and to next month is a foundational series on prayer. Okay? This is not going to answer every question about prayer. There's a lot of things. Why do some prayers get answered? Why do, some pe- why do good things happen to bad people? Well, you know, why do some people get healed and other people don't? This is not going to answer all those questions. But what I want to do this month is I want to lay a foundation of very, very good practices that are, we are going to be able to build off as the year goes forward. I feel like if we don't get this stuff right in the very beginning, then anything we study or look at or emphasize or talk about or pray is going to be like yelling into the wind. So we've got to get this stuff right. And I'm very, 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 uh, I feel very strongly about this series. And I just got a humongous confirmation about it about 30 seconds ago. We'll show you at the end. So the big idea of today's message is this. Prayer is not a mystical religious practice, but a personal conversation with the one who has all power to act on our behalf. That's the big idea. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 says this. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray with uh, standing in the synagogues and on the street corner to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. That's an interesting statement. What is the motivation behind our prayers? That's important. We need to look at that this year. What is the motivation behind our prayers? Because if it's anything other than what Jesus intended it to be, you've already received your full reward. That may mean the prayer goes unanswered because you've already received what you really, really wanted. Let's keep going. Just as that's a little, uh, you know, side dish for you. But when you pray, 
Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father, who is unseen. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Okay? What does that reward look like? We'll get into that as we go forward. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think that we have that, that by their they, oh, they, they will be heard because of their many words. If if somebody else uses uses a thee and the thou in their prayer, I'm just going to slap them. <laughs> Old English ended a long time ago. You know what this is saying? Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> prayer is not some like m- mystical thing where we have to say all the right words. That's the paganization of prayer. And he's saying they were doing it in the, when, I, when he was around, and we're, st- we're still doing it. We think if we put all the right formulas together, that somehow God now has to work, because I use that thou word. <laughs> thou shaltest do unto me. Just be quiet. Just be plain. Be, be, okay, here's my favorite word. Be authentic. Be authentic with God. Guess what? You're not fooling him. Your your high words, he's like, really? I heard the words you used yesterday when you were upset. Don't go to me with the these and the thous. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Be authentic. Be real. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you even ask about it. He's already on the battlefield fighting for you. He brings back the head. I love that song. We should put up like a realistic version of a slide for that song. He brings back the head of my enemy. Ew. <laughs> next, next, next week, we time we sing that, we're just going to have a guy with a head like, you know. Um, but it's true. He goes before us. He fights behind, before us. And then he makes us feel like, man, we did something great. It was never you. It was always him. And I love this. If you can't get more practical than this, then this is how you should pray. The maker of the universe is now going to lay it out for us. Thank you. (laughs) Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. These two verses are connected. Let me just explain this real quick. Your will be done, your kingdom come, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us us, daily bread. So often we flip those around. God, make my kingdom big. Make my kingdom come. My will be done. Give me everything I want, and then I'll do a little bit over here as a pittance for you. You'll, You'll get your daily bread, God, but I want my kingdom. Sorry, we do, and I'm as guilty as the next man. We do. It's, 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 it's what we call um, human nature. You know what we like to do as humans? The exact opposite of what God tells us to do. We like to flip it around. Hey, Adam, don't eat the fruit. That's what we do. We're so thick. But that's what we do. We want our kingdom to come. Our will be done here on earth and in heaven. And God, I'll give you your daily bread. You you know, I'll give you something. It's got to be all about him and less about us. Forgive us our debts, Lord. But don't forgive those that hurt me. Wreck them, God. You said vengeance is yours. I'm waiting for the repayment, God. You saw what my boss did to me. I thank you for your forgiveness, but come on, God. That guy is beyond forgiveness. Now, that's a, it's saying funny, but there's our, there are situations where we don't feel like people deserve forgiveness. And sometimes they're traumatic things, and I understand that. Let me get serious for a second. God forgave us everything. He asks us to do the same. 
Do you see how this prayer is working? It's not all about us getting stuff. It's about us keeping God first and being like him in the world. It's different than how we pray. We really break it down. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In the tabernacle and the temple, just in front of the veil separating the holy place from the most holy place, was an altar of incense. Go ahead and throw that picture up. That's kind of what it looked like. Altar of incense. We don't know exactly what it looked like, but that's, that is a, a taking the, the text in the Old Testament of what it looked like, and that's kind of an artist's rendering of what that was. It was very close to the Ark of the Covenant. Very close. I mean, really literally separated by a veil. Now, there was three pieces of uh, uh, furniture in the temple, and this is one of them. And I should say in the holy place. There was the, 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 the table of showbread, which, which, which represented the eternal provision of God. The table of showbread had bread on it, literal bread. And that bread was never to be stale and never to be gone from there. It was always supposed to be there to represent the eternal provision of God. And then there was a, a, a lampstand that was always supposed to be lit, never to go out, to represent God's light that never goes out and always casts out darkness. And then there was the table of incense. Now I want to focus, and you'll notice that in, in, in our graphic uh, for this series is a kind of a wafting of smoke. And I want to, I want to focus in on that for a second because it's, it's kind of important and kind of neat, actually. It was really just the very closest thing to the Ark of the Covenant. Now, there was a veil. And then behind the veil was the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant and the, um, and the cherubs covered it and the, the mercy seat was. Above that, which is where, where that was, was literally the concentration, physical manifestation of the presence of God. It was seen as a cloud or fire, smoke. The altar was the 36 inches high, 18 inches both length and breadth, according to uh, the scriptures. In each corner was a horn, which the priest, the high priest, would dab with blood on the annual day of atonement. It served as a place for the daily burning of incense, incense, not incense, <laughs> uh, both morning and evening. You try to say all these words. All right. Uh, the daily exercise consisted of a priest selected by a casting of lots. You'll see, you remember this story from when John the Baptist was announced to his father, Zacharias. He was there. It was, and this casting of lots was something that was done, and it was the one time in a priest's life that he'd get to do this. It was like a lottery. You, they cast the lots, and this priest would get one opportunity in his entire life to burn incense before the Ark of the Covenant, before the presence of God. Big deal. It was a big deal. So taking burning coals from the brazen altar, which was outside in the court, which where they would sacrifice all of the animals, they take the coals from the altar of, of, in, to the call, altar of incense and deposit them in the incense. Of, and then they, what they would do is they put the coals in the top of this thing, which was up there, the, the little thing. And then they would pour incense on top of the coals. And it would send forth this fragrance and a plume of smoke. Now, you've got to see where all, everything is representing something, Right? It all, it's all has a meaning. Exodus 30, 34 through 35 says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Take fragrant spices, uh, gum resin, anica, uh, galbanum, you try to say these, a pure frankincense, all in equal amounts, and make a fragrant blend of incense. 
the work of a perfumer. It is to be salted and pure and sacred. Now listen to this. The fragrance was so sweet that the Mishnah records from Jericho, 12 miles away, they could smell the scent of the compounding of the incense. It was potent stuff. The mission also says, my father's household had goats on the mountains of Mitzvah, east of the Jordan River. I don't know, east of the Jordan River. And they used to sneeze from the odor, odor of the compounding of the incense. Now, if you know Israel geography, east of the Jordan River is a long way away. It's basically 12 miles plus. And the goats are sneezing. That's some potent stuff. In the Talmud, it says that pilgrims fr- coming from Jericho to Jerusalem could smell this mixture of the anointing oil and the incense and realize that their eyes would soon behold the temple itself. What is the representation here? Remember I said this is an introduction to the series. It was close to the presence of God. It was a sweet smelling fragrance. This means that it was good to God. He loved it. It was so good. It was so potent. And the smoke rising from the incense represented the prayers of the people of Israel. All of this represents this. God loves when his people pray. It is so sweet to him. It is so good to him. He loves it. He wants it. It's close to his heart. The interaction between his people and him, it's like the fragrance of this potent perfume rising to heaven. He loves it so much. Isaiah 1, 12 through 20 says this. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Well, that doesn't sound good. Let's keep going. Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. Wait, what's happening here? What's, we just said he loves this, right? He loves it. Wait a minute, hold on a second. Does he love the ritual or does he love the heart? Does he love the prayers of his people or is he just really excited about smelling the incense? If he wanted to do that, he could sit with the goats in Jericho. It's not about that. So we're contrasting here. What does God love and what frustrates him, makes him upset? Okay. Your new moon uh, and Sabbaths are uh, calling of conver- uh, convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. All these rituals that God, that Jesus, that God Himself told the Israelites, you have to do these. You need to do these. He's saying, I hate them. Why is he saying that? I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many, oh, here we go, prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's case. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. 
Though your sins are as scarlet, though they are red like crimson, they shall become whole, uh, like wool. If you are willing and obedient, now listen to me here, folks. This is the word of God. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall eat, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So what is they're doing all the ritual? They're burning this incense that Jesus, that the God said he loves so much. That's close to his presence. Yet he's saying, I can't stand it. I, 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 I loathe it. You guys are you're driving me nuts with this, all the sound that you're making. Yet because you're not, your heart is so far from me. We can practice all the religious garbage in the world, and our hearts can be far from God. And you know what he says? He says, it's going to amount to a hill of nothing. we got to be careful, folks, that we don't fall into that same pattern. Isaiah 59 says this, Behold, the Lord, uh, Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, or is here dull that he cannot hear. Well, then why are my prayers getting answered? If, he's, if he can hear it, or if he can, if he can act, if his arm's not too short, I know that's a funny way of saying it, but, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. God isn't going nowhere. It's us that puts a wedge. And your sins have hidden his face from you that he does not hear. Ouch, ouch, that's harsh, that's harsh. And I know, you know what everybody's going? I know what you're saying, because every, every New Testament Christian likes us to do this. Oh, that was Old Testament. We get to do whatever we want now. It is Old Testament, and much of that scripture is meant for the Israelite people. I'm not stupid. I know that. I know that. But let me just read something to you here. Let's, let's go to the New Testament, shall we? Romans 15, 4 says this. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. Uh-oh. Dang. <laughs> that means I have to actually look at that stuff. And throughout and that, uh, that through endurance and through encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Pastor, those are not hopeful scriptures. They are, if we take them for what they're meant to be, conviction. James chapter 5, 16 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Did you know that even in the Old Testament, when we talked about it, that altar of incense that represented the prayers of the people was null and void unless it was sanctified by the blood from the altar. There was a, there was a, a, a thing that had to happen on the Day of Atonement. The priest had to bring in a, 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 a jar or whatever they used, one of the temple utensils of blood, and he had to rub the blood of the sacrifice on the horns of the altar, sanctifying the altar so that the prayers could go up to God. It's never been a place in, our, in, in, in any of history that says that our prayers just go to God. It always takes an atoning sacrifice for prayers to be heard by God. Even in the Old Testament. The cool thing is, Hebrews chapter 4 says this. Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then go confidently, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice that allows our, our sins to be washed away and our prayers to be heard. Without him, there is no point in praying. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that our prayers have any potency. Remember that. First John 5:13. I write these things to you 
who believe. That's you, Deb. Right? You believe. That's you, Phyllis, right? You believe. That's the church, folks. First John is, is written to the church. So we better take heed. I write things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know what you ha- that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. How do you know what the will of God is? If we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what he asked, we have what we ask of him. There's a lot of, you know what's you know in that passage a lot? The word no. How do you know? You got to know. How do you know? You got to know. You know what we call a friend who only calls when they need something? A bad friend. When they only call when they need something. Hey, we haven't talked in two years, but, you know, my car. Okay. Two years later. Hey, buddy, how are you? We haven't talked in two years. Thanks for the car two years ago. Yeah, we haven't talked since. Yeah, I know, it's been busy. But, uh, yeah, there's a thing. I kind of got upside down on my mortgage. wonder if you could co-sign. You know what we call that? A hang-up. When somebody calls only when they need something, we call that a bad friend. You don't know me. You don't know what I want. You don't know what's best. You don't, we don't know one another, folks. How do you know the will of God? You've got to know God. You've got to know him in his word. You've got to know him in your prayer life. You've got to know the person of Jesus Christ to know what the will of God is. Because you can cherry pick scriptures all day long. I am so tired of TV evangelists cherry picking scriptures and asking people for their money. I'm, I'm sick of it. It gives the whole church a bad name. I want to know God. And I'm saying, look, folks, 2019, I want to up the game. I want, I want, I want as a pastor, as 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 a husband, as a father, as a son, as a brother, as a person, as a member of this church, as a a member of humanity. I want to up my game. I want to know my God. I want to be able to pray, and I want to be able to pray with power because I know it's the will of God that I'm praying. And I can't know that until I know him better. This is all foundational, folks. I think we got to get this stuff in in our heads that that. God is not a genie in a bottle. When the, when, when, when the, when the priest came in, he came, he came as close as he could to the, to the Holy of Holies. And what did he do? He lifted up prayers to God. And it was so sweet to God that it, it was represented by the most potent, sweet things that you can mix together. And in fact, they said, don't you dare try to make this for your house. This is only for my house. This is my joy. This is my fragrance. This is what I get. You don't get this. This is special to me. That's how important it was. That's how much we loved it. I think that's a, I think, I think honestly, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just preaching in the mirror today. But I'm not there. I want to get there so bad. I want to get to the place where, where my prayer time is not a, a litany of things that, are, that I need from God, but that his kingdom would come, that his will would be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. And God, if you see fit, give me my daily bread. 
I know you will. You're already... If you clothe the, the, the grass of the field with such splendor, even more splendor than the, 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 the king, of, than king Solomon, I know you're going to take care of me. I don't have to worry about that. That's just daily bread stuff. If you feed the ravens who, you know, who are everywhere, how much more do you care about me? I don't need to worry about that. You know, all of our, many, I shouldn't say all, many of our prayers are daily bread prayers that God's like, again, really? You're praying about flowers and grass and food for the birds. I got it. Let's move on. Let's get into some relationship stuff here. Let's enjoy one another. We've spent all this time talking about daily bread stuff. Move on. Am I the only? I mean, I, am I the only one? Let's hey, this year. Let's say, let's say in 2019. Let's move on. Let's move on to something better, to the kingdom of the God, His kingdom come, His will be done on earth and as in heaven. Let's get to those kind of prayers. Verse 18. We know that anyone born of God does not continue in sin. Ooh. Do we know that? I hope so. The one who is born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. Isn't that nice? You know what that's cool about? You know what's cool? Is that we have the atoning of God in our lives. That's already done. We can go boldly to the throne of grace because he's cleansed us from the sin that keeps us out of his presence. That's already done. We don't keep on sinning. We don't live that life anymore because he's already taken care of it. We know that we are children of God. Now, while uh, the whole world is under the control of the, evil, of the evil one, we're children of God while everybody else is under the control of the evil one. And you wonder, and I wonder, why there's so much injustice in the world. We wonder why The persecuted church is greater today than it ever has been. Think about it for two seconds. How could the persecuted church be at a a higher percentage than ever before? Well, there's more people on the planet than ever before. Therefore, there's more Christians on the planet than ever before. And there's more people controlled by the evil one than ever before. Therefore, when the two collide, we get percentage levels that are higher than ever before. Simple math. It's not going to change unless we do our job and we invoke the kingdom of God on this earth as it is in heaven. We are children of God. And that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him. No, no. It's all over this verse. Know him who is true. And... We are in him. Can anybody say amen? amen. Who is true by being, uh, being in his son, Jesus Christ. He is true. He is the true God and eternal life. That's just the introduction to the series. <laughs> What I want to get settled right now is that as we talk about prayer this series and this year, that we are not going to be talking about if you do X and Y, you'll get Z. Listen, I've been studying for that, trying to find that. God, can you show me the X and the Y to accomplish this healing. The X and the Y to accomplish church growth. The X and the Y that makes the Z that is dot, dot, dot. Financial health, all that stuff. And I'm telling you, you're going to find this is the burden of being a pastor. Okay? I can only share with you what God has revealed to me. 
you're going to find people who will cherry pick the scriptures and are going to try to find formulas that you can implement. If they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm not going to attack them. I just don't see it. I personally don't see it. I don't see X and Y equals Z every time. I see that every prayer prayed to God is supposed to be done out of a heart of love and relationship to Jesus. Back from the Old Testament all the way through through the New Testament, that's what it's about. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. It's not about ritual. It's about relationship. In fact, the people of God were doing all the religion, doing all the ritual, and God says, get out of my courts. You're trampling them. It's driving me crazy because your hearts are far from me, so far from me that not that I can't, not that I can't hear you, I won't hear you. Folks, let's get to a place. <laughs> this, is my, this is me this year. I want to get to a place where my prayers are like a sweet-smelling fragrance that rises into the nostrils of God, and he just goes, oh, I love it when David prays. I love it. I wish we could do more of it. I want to be, uh, yeah, you're, you're starting to get it, David boy. You're starting to get it. God calls me David boy because that's just the way it is. You can, do not call me David boy. It's like the incense, it's only for God. Okay. Uh, David boy, you're getting it. You're getting it. We're, we're starting to get in sync now. Now you're starting to see what my will is, and you're praying according to what I deem is worthy and valuable and important in this world. And now you're going to see the gates of heaven open, and I'm going to pour out my power and my love on the things that now we are getting together. That's what I see. Folks, I'm not perfect. This is. All I can do is glean from the word of God what I see and God is leading me towards. And I would say, be careful with it. It's valuable. Do not add anything to it. Do not take anything away from it. Make sure that when you read it, you are reading it in context, in the right way. Do not cherry pick the word of God. Make sure you get the whole counsel. And I will try to do that with you every week. That is my goal. Everybody take a deep breath. So the key verse to this series is, you think I'm joking, I'm not. The key verse to this series, and we will start looking at it next week. And this was the confirmation that I needed that I was in the right place, because I was a little bit nervous about this series. I'm telling you right now. If my people... Thank you, Alberta, for hearing the voice of God. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And this is how we're going to break it down. Next week, we're going to talk about the chosen and the called. The chosen and the called. The next time we touch on this, after we're going to have a guest speaker in two weeks, that's going to be fun, a missionary coming. When we get back to the series in three weeks after that, two weeks after that, it's going to be the humble and the hungry. And then we're going to close it down with the Repentant and restored. I'm telling you, folks, this whole, this whole series is foundational for the year. So if you miss a week, don't miss a week. <laughs> but if you should, everything, thank you, Evan, everything will be online, on our website.
Guys, I just want to say this last thing before I close in prayer. This is what God has revealed to me this series. I don't want to be wrong. I'm not perfect with this stuff. I'm learning just like you are. But I feel God is leading us in this direction as a church. And he's put that burden on me to steer us as a church in a certain direction. And I believe prayer is the emphasis he wants to put on this year. I've been praying about this. (laughs) Praying and God says, you need to learn how to pray. (laughs) Let's talk about prayer this year because your prayer is... No, no. uh, He's saying, we as a church, we've, we, we, we've done all that we can do. We've worked hard. We have for two, almost two years now we've been in this mobile location. We've worked hard. And look, it, there's, there's, there's more people here than there's ever been. But it's never going to amount to anything that's super impactful to the kingdom unless we win the battles in the spiritual. I'm telling you right now, Enfield, Connecticut, for some reason... I've heard it from pastor upon pastor upon pastor. I was here, what's the year, what's the year now, 2019? I was here 19 years ago in a little plant church that closed because there's a spiritual stronghold for some reason around this 91 corridor in Enfield. And it's not going to break by putting a, a stage in a movie theater, by doing great music. That's part of it, but it's not going to break. The spiritual strongholds don't break because of clever planning. The spiritual strongholds break when God's people humble themselves. They pray. They seek God's face. They turn from the evil that they are in, at least, whether they're doing or, or they're just soaking themselves in it. And they pray out of a pure heart in spirit and in truth.